So Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 14, which says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasseth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Let's just ask for God's help, shall we? Our Father, we do come into thy presence again this evening with thanksgiving. We thank thee, our Father, for the word of God. It's living, it's powerful. It refreshes us. Uh, thy word speaks to us, draws us to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, gives us food for our soul and uh, living water, our Father, for our thirst. And so we ask, Father, this evening that we would be indeed deeply encouraged as we would uh, read these uh, wonderful uh, truths of the work of the Lord Jesus mm -hmm. Christ in our heart. We pray, Father, that uh, they would speak to us, that uh, we would be given the help of the same gracious Holy Spirit who gave these words and that thy Holy Spirit would work in a way in each of our hearts that would be individual and personal and uh, we pray Father that each of us would be drawn into a deeper appreciation of the Lord Jesus and encouraged in our Christian path. So be with us uh, Father we pray this evening as we would ask Father for this help asking for it in Jesus name. Amen. So we come towards the end then of Ephesians chapter number 3 into what perhaps is one of the more difficult sections I think of this, uh, this epistle. There are some real difficult ones to get our heads round that we might come to maybe uh, this week or maybe even uh, next week. But you notice that we start in verse number 14 where Ephesians chapter 3 verse 1 started. We seem to be back to the beginning. Do you remember that in chapter 3 verse 1 the apostle says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. And it seems that by the time we reach verse 14, he's kind of gone back to where he began for this cause. It seems that from verse 1 through to verse 13, he, he got distracted. But, you know, we're not going to complain that he got distracted because perhaps you'll remember that he, he peered through those prison bars and he got a glimpse. Do you remember what he got a glimpse of? He got a glimpse of those, verse 8, unsearchable riches of Christ. And you remember that we saw that in the sovereign hand of the Lord Jesus that that prison it became a treasure house a place where the apostle Paul could appreciate something more deeply of the person of the Lord Jesus uh, I remember the story being told to me some time ago uh, of a, a prisoner I believe he was in China uh, and all he had was his recollection of the scriptures and they put him into solitary confinement uh, and he just went round and round in his head meditating and discovering things in the scriptures he had never discovered before he was just enjoying the person of the Lord Jesus Christ in the prison cell. Well, here in Ephesians 3, that's something uh, uh, kind of what we have, isn't it? And at the beginning of chapter 3, you remember that Paul, he doesn't blame Pontius, he doesn't, sorry, he, he, he doesn't blame Caesar, uh, he doesn't blame the, the priests for putting him in prison, he doesn't blame those that accused him, but you notice that he looks upwards, uh, even beyond Satan and those that are against him, he looks upwards as high as he can and he sees in verse number 1 that he's the prisoner of Christ Jesus, Christ the Messiah, uh, the one who is king. You'll find all that, of course, in Psalm 2. He's the, he's the one who's in control. And so we have one who is sovereign over the prison cell 
And we have also one who is the saviour in the prison cell. And so from that prison cell is poured out Paul's appreciation of the Lord Jesus. We read about the dispensations. We won't go over them again, but you notice they're mentioned there in verse number two, the dispensations. He gives us this huge panorama of everything that God is doing from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. From the beginning when man was in innocence, right to the way to the end, into heaven and the eternal state. And and perhaps just reflecting in his mind the way that God through all of the purposes of life and the history of this world he works all things together for good in those that love the Lord and that are called according to his purpose even a Pontius Pilate appointed governor of uh, Jerusalem all of those years ago you may say well everything was out of control when Pontius Pilate condemned the Lord Jesus Christ to death and put him upon the cross well the two in the road to Emmaus thought so didn't they 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 thought the, the game was over and yet even in the sovereign hand of God God was working out his purpose uh, through law and through grace and through the, the, the many movements uh, of men. And so dispensations, God has his purpose from, from time into eternity. And then he speaks to us a little about a bit of those uh, deep mysteries of God. You remember verse number four of Ephesians 3, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And we thought very briefly of that uh, interesting subject of the mysteries that you find through the New Testament I suggested 14 of them uh, but you might remember that out of those 14 there are the three greats Uh, two great mysteries and the mystery of a great thing great is the mystery of godliness 1 Timothy 3.16 that God has as his sovereign purpose the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ the glorification of the Lord Jesus And that great mystery of Ephesians chapter, uh, right at the end of Ephesians chapter number five, the mystery of Christ and his church, that God also has as his purpose the bringing into an eternal relationship with himself, those that were separate from him. And then finally, uh, the mystery of Babylon the Great and Revelation 17, that God will remove all that reject and rebel against him. And if you bring those mysteries together, I would suggest that you have a reasonable summary of the Bible. That is that it is God's purpose, first of all, to uh, glorify his son, uh, to to raise him up, to present him, to exalt him, and to glorify the Lord Jesus. Secondly, his purpose is to bring a people who are lost into a living and eternal relationship with himself. And thirdly, he will ultimately and finally remove everything that is against him. And so Paul takes us, maybe just a little gives us a little flavor of the mysteries and then he brings us in verse number eight into those unsearchable riches of Christ and we saw that in the Lord Jesus there are those things that go beyond the mere material things that we might value but we find in the Lord Jesus Christ everything that we need the essential riches of life forever he is are you hungry He's the bread of life. Are you thirsty? He is the living water. Do you like joy? Well, you remember he's the one that brought wine to the Cana of Galilee. You're facing death? He is the resurrection and the life. You're not sure how to get to heaven? He is the door. You're not sure of the way to heaven? He is the way, the truth, and the life. You need a (laughs) saviour? Ah, well, he has given himself for us. He has shed his own blood for us. You say, heaven seems so far away. God seems so distant. He is our great high priest. You say, I'm I'm going through a period of of, of deep soul searching and sorrow. He is our comforter, the one that is closer than a brother. He is everything that we need. So the apostle then, we'll forgive him, won't we? The apostle, in a sense, gets distracted as he looks through those prison cells and he sees something greater than the prison that he's in. He sees something of those unsearchable riches of Christ. And so the apostle then, by the time we get to verse 14, it seems to be back on track as to where he was at the beginning for this cause, for this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For this cause, I bow my knees. <laughs> Sometimes uh, over uh, by at the surgery, uh, people come in not just with medical problems, as, as you may know. Uh, sometimes people come in and they will explicitly ask me to pray for them or pray with them. It's not an uncommon thing, not an uncommon thing. Maybe you might be surprised how many people actually do ask me to pray for them and pray with them. There's one man in particular that I remember, obviously I'll name no names and give nothing that can identify him, but there is one man in particular that sticks very much in my mind. He, he went through all of the problems he had in life and it was a, 
it was a catalogue of utter catastrophe. Uh, there was all sorts of abuse in the past and all sorts of wickedness had been done to him and his life was very much broken. And his present experience was troubled by, with financial worries and marital problems and problems with his children. It just, just seemed that almost every part of his life, every year of his life, brought another disaster. It was disaster upon disaster upon disaster. And uh, I remember we, we began speaking a little bit about some of the ways he'd look for help. He'd look for these self-help books, you know, the 12 rules for living and uh, those, kind of a, uh, those kind of a thing. There's lots of them out there and uh, he went through them all. He said, I've tried them all, I've read them all. He said, and they're all rubbish, they don't work, they don't work. He said, would you do something for me? He said, would you pray for me? I says, John, we'll call him John. I says, yes, we will pray for me pray for you John and I'll never forget what he did he, he dropped off his seat sitting next to me and he dropped on his knees in the middle of that subway and, and we started to pray now many people have asked me to pray with them and for them but I've never seen anybody drop to their knees in the subway to pray and that's what happens here in Ephesians 3 verse number 14 as the Apostle Paul prays he prays on his knees for this cause I bow my knees. Now let me remind you how it was that he ended up there. It wasn't an easy path that led him to, to coming down there on his knees before the Lord Jesus. And you might remember that just a few books before Ephesians, he didn't even believe in the Lord Jesus. You remember that? You only have to go back to the Acts of the Apostles. And he was actively persecuting the Lord Jesus. The first time he came to the Lord Jesus on his knees, that was a period of, of, of deep trauma, of deep shock. His whole world had been turned upside down. Everything he believed was out the window. And there upon his knees he, he confessed the Lord Jesus Christ as his Lord and Saviour. But here it's after the prison. It's after persecution. It's after suffering in Ephesians chapter number 3. And it brings him to his knees. If there's anything I might say this, this evening that might be of help and an encouragement to us. I think it is this. That whatever it is that takes to get me to my knees before the Lord Jesus Christ. It is worth it. It is worth it because it's there on his knees that we see real power. Whether it be leprosy that takes the ten men to come before the Lord Jesus Christ or whether it be a, a dying and a dead daughter that brings Jairus to the person of the Lord Jesus or whether it's demon possession with the man of the Gadarenes or a woman that's been slowly bleeding to death for 12 years. Whatever kind of disappointment, sadness or sorrow it is that brings us to that point. It is, in verse number 14, the point of power. The point of power. You might look at verse 14 and you might see a, a great man on his knees and you might see, you might perceive, if you were a naturally minded person, you might see a person that's in his weakness. You say, here's a prisoner. He's in a cell. Everything that he, he, he's desiring to do has been frustrated. He's curtailed. He's on his knees. He's weak. You'll never read a more powerful prayer than what you have here. In Ephesians chapter number 3, verses 14 to 21, it's the place of power. The place of power. If you ever do get there, can I ask you to do something? Verse number 14. For this cause I bow my knees. If you ever get there, may I ask you to do this? Get out your pocket calculator and count the number of knees you're on. <laughs> I misread this once. And I read it like this. And you'll tell me, Stuart, you need to read your Bible more carefully. I read it like this. For this cause I bow my knee. And then I noticed something. It wasn't just one, it was both. This is the Apostle Paul, totally committed to the Lord Jesus. Maybe he had learned from Peter many years ago. Do you remember Peter? When, when, when the, why don't we just flick back to it? I, I think I've even marked it because I, I thought I might just read it to you. Yeah, there it is. Luke chapter number 5. Let me remind you of the mistake Peter made. He made the same mistake I made, so maybe I'm in good company. Uh, Luke chapter number 5. Luke chapter number 5. You'll remember it. It's a well-known story. Luke chapter number 5. Verse number 3, just to Give us a little bit of background here. Luke 5 verse 3. And he, the Lord Jesus, entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, that's Peter. And he prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. 
Now when he had left speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said to him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. <laughs> and when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and the net break. My, if he had just been more, paid a little more attention to the grammar, that net wouldn't have broken. Because he'd have put both nets down, wouldn't he? Not just the one, but he'd have been, he'd have been totally committed to the words of the Lord Jesus. You see, when, when, when my mind and my heart is divided, that's a point of weakness. You, you remember the story of the twelve spies? And they went to spy out Canaan and a mixed report, they were divided. A mixed report comes back. Ten out of twelve say we can't take the land. There are giants in the land, it's too hard. There was a division between them. They were on two minds. They were in a place of weakness and they never entered in. Do you remember Elijah up there in Mount Carmel as he speaks to the people of God? How long do you halt between two opinions? Is it God or is it Baal? Between two opinions, a divided loyalty brings weakness. But just get a glimpse of the simplicity of it here in Ephesians 3.14. Here's the Apostle Paul. And he's 100% into this. I bow my knees. He's down there before God. He's down there, of course, praying. Praying in a particular way. Do you remember in the past we noticed that in the New Testament there are perhaps at least five ways that we can pray. There are those requests that we can make for ourselves. There are intercessions we can make for others. And that's what the Apostle Paul is doing here. He's really interceding for us and for the Ephesians. For this cause I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family and earth uh, as uh, heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. So he's making intercession for these Ephesians. And that, of course, is a burden that perhaps you and I will find that we have, or at least we ought to have. The Christian, you see, has two burdens in prayer. He has a burden for himself, but if you're a spiritually minded person, you will also see that others ought to have a burden and they don't have a burden and you'll carry that burden for them to the Lord Jesus. Intercession is when we feel the weakness that another does not feel. And the Apostle Paul, you see, he's got insight into what the Ephesians need even more than what the Ephesians have insight into. And so he brings an intercession before God. He bows the knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For this cause, I bow my knees under the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For, for, for what cause? Well, that takes us back to the beginning of chapter number three. And, of course, chapter number three follows on from chapter number two. And for that cause is this great cause of the church that you'll find in Ephesians chapter number two. It's, it's what God is doing. You see, there is something unique about the Christian. Maybe we could say that there are two groups of people in this world. There, there are a group of people, and you'll have met them, I've met them on and off over the years. There's a group of people, they're a difficult group to deal with, a difficult group to get on with, because there's a group of people who can see nothing more important than themselves. You'll have met them. They're a hard group to deal with. Very self-centred, very selfish, uh, hard-hearted, very introspective. Eh? And then there's another group of people who can see something or someone better than themselves. And the believer ought to be that kind of a person. A person who sees something or someone greater than themselves. And the Apostle Paul, he can see that he is part of a bigger work, a greater thing that God is doing. And that this little time of his discomfort, this little time of his deprivation, and, and this little time of his imprisonment is for a greater glory. It's for the glory of the Lord Jesus and the blessing of his people. And so he's fully committed uh, to uh, the work of God. For this cause, he sees something greater than himself. Uh, that's not always an easy thing. Not always an easy thing. Demas couldn't see that. The world was more important to him than anything else. Uh, yeah. Judas Iscariot couldn't see that. Money was the most important thing. Wasn't it? But here, uh, Paul can see that the work of God is the greatest thing. That he would grant you, verse number 16, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit 
in the inner man, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. Now, here's the Apostle Paul, and he's down on his knees before the Lord Jesus, and he sees his weakness, and he sees the weakness of God's people. And he's going to pray for strength. Now again, if I might just suggest that when you do get there, not only do you count your knees, but when you do get there praying for strength, pray for it in the right way. I, I don't pray for strength like this, but I ought to pray for strength like this. The kind of strength that I pray is that God might strengthen me according to my weakness. But don't pray like that. That's Stuart's silly mistake. Don't you pray like that. You pray better than that. Don't just pray that God might strengthen you according to your weakness. God doesn't strengthen you according to your weakness. If I could illustrate what I mean by that. Many years ago, we had a practice nurse over, over by. And one of our boys was going to learn the piano. And uh, we were looking for a piano. And she says, listen, Stuart, I, I've got an old piano. She says, you, you, you can come and you can have it for free. Uh, it was later on I realised why she did that, because old pianos are really hard to get rid of, uh, because there's an awful lot of shifting involved in old pianos, and she was upstairs. So really what she was doing was getting me to lift her old piano for free and take it away. I wasn't, I wasn't as sharp as maybe I was after the event, but I knew anyway there was going to be quite a bit of lifting involved in that piano. So I was looking for somebody to make up that deficit, right? So there's the piano, and there's me, and there's this gap of strength. And at the time here in New Cumnock, there, there was a man called Rab, Rab Mackay, that was Craig's grandfather. Uh, and Rab, uh, well, Rab's biceps made up for my weakness. And so I took Rab and his van along. And, and, and that gap between my weakness and where I needed to be, that was made up by Rab. And we managed the piano. Well, Rab managed the piano, I think I opened the door actually, to, to let him put it in the back. But God doesn't strengthen you like that. He doesn't say, Stuart, you know, what you really need is, is, uh, uh, is, is 10 horsepower for that job and, and all you've got is 8 horsepower. So I'll tell you what, I, I, I'll fill the gap. I'll give you an extra two just to fill. That's not the way God works. He does not strengthen you according to your weakness. You notice how he strengthens us. Verse number 16. And this is how I ought to pray. Verse 16. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. To be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. God strengthens you according to his glory. Now that's so important. So important. There's some wonderful illustrations of this in the word of God. Let me take you back to some of them. They're well known. Uh, but let me just read them in the light of what we've read there in Ephesians 3. Back into the book of Judges, please. Let me show you, uh, so that there is no dubiety or uncertainty about this, that God never strengthens according to our weakness, but he strengthens according to his glory. All right. So here's a man, Gideon. Gideon was full of self-doubt and really doubted his own strength. You read about that in Judges 6. God chose him and Oh, you can't choose me. I'm the, I'm, I'm the weakest and part of the least family in, in Israel and so forth. You read all about that. And, and now he's got a real challenge in his hand. He's going to go out uh, against the Midianites. The Midianites. And in Judges chapter number 6, the Midianites will, will gather like grasshoppers, it says in verse 12 of Judges 7. So there's this vast host of an enemy. Vast host. Innumerable. doesn't even try and number them. In Judges chapter number 7. Uh, and here's, here's Gideon. Uh, he's got a bit of an inferiority complex to say the least. Um, but he does have something in his favour. He's got 32,000 men. Now I don't really know the numbers of Midianites. But it seems to be a lot more than that. Because it's not even numbered. right? But 32,000 I think is probably a pretty good start. But listen. When God is going to strengthen Gideon. He's not going to make up the deficit. And let me prove to you how God does not make up the deficit. He does not strengthen Gideon according to his weakness. Look at what he does. Judges chapter number 7, verse number 3. Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people twenty and two thousand, and there remained ten thousand. It's a bad move. <laughs> I've got 32,000 people and I'm up against this innumerable host of the Midianites they're just like locusts or grasshoppers and, and God has cut my army he's not made up the difference he's cut my army 
from 32,000 down to 10,000. Verse number three. But it gets worse. It gets worse. Verse number four. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people are yet too many. Now, that wouldn't be my assessment. My assessment would be the people are too few. But God says they're too many. Bring them down to the water and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that whom uh, I say unto thee, uh, this shall go with thee and so forth. We get down to verse number five. So he brought down the people to the water and the Lord said unto Gideon, every one that laps of the water with his tongue as a dog laps, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, every one that bows down upon his knees to drink and the number of them that lap, putting their hand to their mouth, were 300. So he cuts, God cuts the army, right? I've got 32,000 men. I'm up against a far greater uh, foe than I can muster an army for. Okay, I've got a solution, says God. I want you to cut your army from 32,000 down to 10,000 down to 300. That doesn't sound like a great answer to me. Because, you see, God does not strengthen according to our weakness. He strengthens according to his glory. His glory. And his glory is going to be seen in the defeat of this insurmountable enemy, just with 300 men. And in fact, they don't even have to use their weapons. The story goes on. That, of course, true is true again. Do you remember that uh, story that we have in uh, that event that we have in John chapter number 11? Um, it mystifies Mary and Martha. John chapter number 11. It mystifies Mary and Martha that uh, here is the, uh, their, their brother and, and he's sick and they send for the Lord Jesus and John 11, uh, verse number 1. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, town of Mary and her sister Martha. By the, at the beginning of John 11, uh, he's sick. But the Lord Jesus Christ delays his coming to Lazarus. And so by the time he arrives there in verse number 21, Martha says, then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother had not died. But listen, you see, the Lord Jesus isn't just going to strengthen Lazarus according to his weakness. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to wait until Lazarus dies. And as you come down uh, John chapter number 11, let me show you what he's going to do here. John chapter number 11, Verse number 40, and Jesus said to her, said I not to thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. Well, you see, it would be a small thing for the Lord Jesus Christ to take a sick man, he had done that so many times before, and to make him better, or a weak man, and make him stronger, or an unhealthy man, and make him healthier. But here in John 11, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to strengthen him according, not to his weakness, but according to the glory of God. And so Lazarus will come out of the grave as a display of the deity, the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, as a testimony to his glory. God works in a glorious way. And so in verse 16 in Ephesians chapter 3, as the Apostle Paul bows the knee, or bows knees, I did it again. That's bad, isn't it? For this cause, I bow my knees. In verse number 14. He bows his knees before the Lord Jesus. And he intercedes, verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Pray not that he would strengthen you according to your weakness, but according to his glory. Don't pray that you might be the greatest shepherd. Maybe a little better than you once were. But to be strengthened according to his glory rather than according to your weakness means that he's able to take a shepherd boy and bring down Goliath with him. Yeah. Don't pray that you, that, that you might just be a great servant in Potiphar's house, that you, that you might be strengthened according to your weakness, but rather strengthened according to his glory, that you might be second in rule in the nation of Egypt, that you might save your brothers from starvation, and that through your brothers there might come Messiah. It's for the glory of God, not just according to your weakness. There, of course, at the end as well of the life of Samson, a man that had carried the, the, the gates of Gaza, a man that had slown, slown hundreds of Philistines with the jawbone of an ass, a man who had 
felt his weakness when his hair was cut and his eyes were taken out. He could have prayed just for a little more strength. Just to be strengthened according to his weakness. Just to be made what he used to be. But that isn't sufficient. There in the temple of Dagon is... Samson bows his head. God strengthens him. And in strengthening him, he brings down the temple of Dagon. And that final, uh, that final death that he dies is his greatest victory. He's strengthened according, not to his weakness, but according to God's glory. And in so doing, verse number 16, as we're strengthened according to his glory, we're strengthened for his glory. Uh, a display of his glory. This isn't just about displaying how great you or I are. Oh, no, no, no. This is a display of the glory of God worked out in his people. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, length, depth and height. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That's an interesting verse, isn't it? That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. As we read that as Christians, of course, uh, perhaps the first thing that comes to, to our mind is the problem of that verse, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Because as, as believers in the Lord Jesus, it is uh, definitive. It's a, it, is, uh, it is a defining point of the Christian that Christ does dwell amongst us. He who has the Son hath life. He that does not have the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides upon him. And yet the Apostle Paul is praying that that might happen, that he might dwell in our hearts by faith. The key to it lies in the word here in verse number 17. It's an unusual word for dwell. Uh, it is the little word dwell, o o o oikio, but at the beginning of that Greek word is a little word cat, and it means, uh, that's a really a kind of intensification. It means that Christ might fully dwell in your hearts. Not just, be pre not just be present in, in our lives or in our hearts, but be president of our lives and our hearts. That he might be at home there, not just, not just resident in a sense, but at home in our hearts. That he might be sovereign and, and in control. It's interesting, by the way, that you won't find Christ dwelling in many places in the scriptures. Uh, you'll find him just in two other places that I'm aware of he, he, he dwells. You'll find him dwelling in Nazareth. And you'll find him dwelling in Capernaum. And finally here you'll find him dwelling in our hearts. It's interesting that in those two other places where we find the Lord Jesus Christ dwelling, he's rejected. He was there at Capernaum and did some of his greatest works in Capernaum. That's the, the scene, by the way, where you'll find the, uh, the uh, turning of the water into wine. It was at Capernaum where that man was lowered through the roof that was uh, carried by the four and who was raised up to walk again. That was Capernaum. It was Capernaum where he taught. It was Capernaum where he cast out the demon from the man in the synagogue. Some of these greatest works were done in Capernaum and yet they rejected, they rejected his power, they rejected his preaching, they rejected his miracles. And the same too, of course, is true of Nazareth. You remember that place where he was brought up and yet they would take him outside the synagogue to cast him down uh, from the top of the hill. But perhaps here in verse number 17, very suitably in the word of God, we have in a sense, if we might use the phrase, Christ's final resting place. <laughs> it is true, isn't it, what is said in the Gospels, that he had nowhere to lay his head in this world. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with grief. He came unto his own, his own received him not. Uh, he never really fully was accepted in places like Nazareth or Capernaum. But here, finally, we find that Christ dwells somewhere. And that dwelling place is in my heart and yours. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the length, breadth, depth. And, height. and that brings us into a new subject, and I think we'll leave that new subject perhaps for next week because it is quite a big subject in its own right. The indwelling of the Lord Jesus and the way that he comes into our hearts through power, through love, and the way that that brings us into the full knowledge of God. Let's just bow our heads in prayer. Our Father, we do come into thy presence uh, 
This evening with thanksgiving, we thank thee for the Lord Jesus. We thank thee, our Father, for the way in which uh, uh, in thy sovereign hand thou art able to take a prison cell and able uh, to turn it into a treasure house. We thank thee, our